As a divorce lawyer, having spent the past 15 years dealing with over hundreds of divorces, the most common question I get from people is, do you still believe in love? And the answer I tell them is usually not that I believe in it, it is that I know enough about it. The question I pose then to all of you is, do you know what marriage really means? When people think of marriages, they think wedding bells, diamond rings, a bride playing a day of princess and a groom drinking to excess. When a couple gets engaged, they spend an insane amount of time thinking about the venue of the wedding, the guest list, even the taste of the wedding cake. But they hardly ever think about the most important thing about getting married. The marriage certificate that you register with the government and what it entails. Marriage is a legally binding contract, not only between the husband and wife, but also between them and the legal system governing their marriage. Marriage also means subscribing to a whole set of financial rights and obligations, which could have implications far beyond the end of the relationship. In fact, that piece of paper you sign, called the marriage certificate, carries an effect even beyond your lifetime, when it comes to your estate and who should inherit it. Normally, when we're asked to say, sign up for gym membership, we do a pretty decent job asking about this and that. We want to know how long the contract would run for, whether there's a penalty to early cancellation, and we may even ask whether there are free towels or enough elliptical machines to satisfy our fitness needs. There are also many of us here who are conscientious buyers, those of us who look at the terms and conditions to everything we purchase, and some would even read the fine print to make sure we're not swindled into a bad deal. Now imagine you're about to subscribe for, say, a broadband service. Most of us here would be asking the right questions, like, how long does the contract run for? What are the benefits or my obligations? What penalties would there be if I want to terminate a contract early? And yet, these are often not the questions that we would ask ourselves before we sign on to what is the, the most important contract of our lives called marriage. When it comes to marriage, the romantic meaning of getting married is so much inflated that even the most normally careful consumer would suffer a lapse of attention when it comes to signing up to what's the biggest deal of our lives. When people are dancing under rainbows and among butterflies being madly in love, they sign on to marriage without contemplating what happens if they want out. Marriage is basically a lifelong, life-changing agreement and yet most people sign on to the contract not feeling the need to set out an exit clause. As much as a Tiffany commercial would like you to think, marriage is not just a romantic commitment, but a legal commitment. As much as rom-coms and fairy tales would make you believe, not all marriages end up happily ever after. Just look at the divorce rate in Hong Kong, over 20,000 in a year. Now, most people know that when a married couple gets divorced, they will fight about how to split the matrimonial assets and whether or not one needs to pay maintenance to the other. But at the same time, most people believe that they would never be the unfortunate ones who end up in that situation, so they don't even think about the event until it actually happens. And then it's too late to go back time and draft up a termination clause. So, pausing there, you may ask, what is the termination clause? Well, you may have heard of the term prenuptial agreements. This is an agreement that you and your partner enter into prior to marriage, which spells out what the financial arrangements would be if your marriage were to suffer a premature lapse. I'm sure that there are some of you here who feels very queasy about the term prenuptial agreements because prenuptial sounds like the idea of possibly breaking up in the future. And we Chinese folks are so superstitious that we think that it's bad luck even to discuss the terms of separation. However, having seen through plenty of divorces myself, I can say from experience 
that planning for the what-ifs is actually a very good foundation for marriage. You see, the process of discussing the terms of a prenuptial agreement opens up deep conversations between partners about your roles and expectations in a marriage, what your plans are in terms of the financial contributions that each of you were to bring into the marriage, and it is the perfect opportunity for you to understand what your partner's finances are like. Most people find the topic of money very awkward to discuss with their partners, so doing a prenup is actually an easy way to open up the topic. After all, how close can two persons really be if they can't even openly discuss the topic of money? I still find it surprising when some of my clients come to me after decades long of marriage completely ignorant of what their spouse's finances are like. They don't even know what their spouse's makes for a living, whether or not their spouse earns an income, or what properties their spouse owns. More important to the point of this talk is how little people who have married actually know the legal principles surrounding a divorce. Now, some of you may have heard about the rule of 50-50 sharing of matrimonial assets. But most people don't seem to really understand what constitute matrimonial assets. Matrimonial assets are not just things that you own or acquire together during a marriage. A lot of my clients get a rude awakening when they realize that the property that the parents generously bought for them as newlyweds can potentially be shared, or the property that they purchased prior to marriage with their own savings without the partner paying a dime for can also be potentially shared. <coughs> and warning for parents, the assets that you accumulated in your lifetime, which you're about to pass to your children as inheritance, can also be matrimonial assets that are to be shared with the future divorcing spouse. And guess what? In the event of a divorce, you don't even own 100% of the little things that are gifted to you over the years. The wedding ring that your husband gave you, the Hermes handbag that you bought with your first paycheck, the Cartier watch that your parents gave you for your graduation. All these will be listed, valued, and shared. They are not your assets, but it is part of the matrimonial assets to be divided. In the case of a divorce, it doesn't matter who paid for what, whether it's inherited or gifted or bought before marriage. It also doesn't matter where, whether there's so name or jointly held. Everything under the sun, be it bank accounts, properties, investments, personal valuable items, even pension and MPF, everything will be put into a pool called the matrimonial assets to be divided. Now, of course, there can be exceptions to whether a certain asset should be excluded from sharing by virtue of it being gifted or inherited or purchased before marriage. However, they are at best exceptions, and a host of factors and conditions are required before one can successfully argue in court that that particular asset should be ring-fenced. And that may be a topic for another day. So, one thing to remember, being married means that you opt out of the title system. From the moment you say, I do, 50% of everything you own, now and in the future, theoretically belongs to your spouse. Unless, of course, if you sign a prenuptial agreement stating otherwise. Apart from the sharing of assets, maintenance is also something that most of us may have a far too simple understanding of. For the man who spoils his wife by lavishing her with Gucci handbags and Prada shoes, taking her out to fine dining restaurants and flying around the world ski on skiing trips every few times a year or flying business class. Well, I applaud you for your generosity, but guess what? Know that the high standard of living that you're maintaining your wife would be taken as a lifestyle in which you're expected to maintain her in the event of a divorce. And the credit cards that you're wife swipes frivolously every month is also going to be representing her needs. Of course, the reverse is also true. If you are the frugal housewife who tries to save as much money as you can for the family, even though your husband may be making millions, well, 
your lean historical expenditure will also be taken into, into account as representing your needs going forward in the event of a divorce. Moreover, while traditionally spousal maintenance is paid until death or remarriage, the courts are now trying to encourage people to maximize their earning capacity instead of relying on their ex-spouses as meal tickets for life. So, unless it's a long marriage, otherwise maintenance is now usually limited to a certain duration of years. For instance, and this is a scenario, scenario that I've come across way too many times. The wife was married to a successful banker, husband. Prior to marriage, she worked for a short few years. And then after marriage, she took upon the duty of a homemaker and looked after the children. In the event of a divorce, even though the husband is now enjoying a successful career as a hedge fund manager, the court may still determine that the wife is only entitled to six, eight, ten years of maintenance because she is considered relatively young in her 40s and is expected to be able to die back into the workforce. In situations where the wife sacrificed a professional career to be a stay-at-home mom for over a decade, she is also expected to be able to stand on her own two feet after certain years of maintenance, never mind the fact that she has actually been out of the workforce for a significant period of time, and it would be difficult for her to pick up her career at an older age. So, newsflash, generosity and self-sacrifice during a marriage may not always work in your favor in the event of a divorce. You see, the court does not make a ledger on who contributed more or who sacrificed more. If you're the one who pays significantly more of the family expenses over the years, or you're the one who used your savings to buy the matrimonial home that you're living in, well, kudos to you because sharing is caring, but you cannot seek a clawback in the event of a divorce. I once acted for a client whose husband was all along unemployed and entirely reliant on her income. She was very supportive of him, and over the years, she gave him funds to set up businesses which were more whimsical than practical. And then, one after the other, those fantastical ventures went bust, and all of that money was basically poured down the drain. She regretted it, of course, when they separated, but it was too late. You see, the law makes no moral judgment, or even more. The law does not compensate one for making poor choices in life. She will still be, therefore, required to share her assets and pay her husband's spouse for maintenance. The basic idea is that you and your spouse are one unit. So whatever you have, you share, the good and the bad. This means that debts that your spouse owes third parties is also your problem. That liability will be paid out from the matrimonial assets in the event of a, a divorce before it is actually divided between the two of you. Unless, of course, if you can satisfy the court that it was such an extremely reckless and irresponsible decision that he has made that you can't reasonably be made to shoulder the debt. So, another thing to remember. Being married to someone means that you're financially responsible for him or her, even if you wish in the future to say, oh, but I don't. Most people, you see, don't realize that by marrying someone, they're actually signing onto a contract. With one of the terms being that you will no longer solely own whatever is solely under your name. And also, that you will always be financially obligated to that person, whether or not you think that that person deserves it or not. In fact, the only term of a marriage that people think that marriage is all about, which is the commitment not to betray the other, whether emotionally or physically, is pretty much redundant because the law does not penalize a person for having committed adultery. And so the fact that you are betrayed by your spouse does not mean that the court will grant you a greater financial award. Up until now, you may be thinking, well, this all doesn't concern me because I'm super confident that my marriage will last. And you may be right. But even the most stable and committed marriage would inevitably need to confront a guaranteed phase in life, the death of a spouse. Again, this is not something that we like to think about, 
But this is another situation where marriage may change and play a hand at things. As I said, marriage brings along a lot of rights and obligations under the law. And the default position when one dies without having made a will is that the law assumes certain arrangements for you. For instance, in Hong Kong, if there's no child of the marriage, whatever you own, by default, most of it would belong to your spouse upon your death. No matter if you and your sister are very close and you would like to pass something to her, or if your elderly parents actually need more of the financial support. If you have children, whatever you own will be 50% inherited by your spouse, and then the remaining 50% inherited by your children in equal shares. So picture a scenario where your husband and your parents do not particularly share a particularly harmonious relationship, and you have no children for your parents to dote on. Upon your death, if you die intestate, which is without having made a will, most of what you have would be passed on to your husband, even if your parents may need it more. And if your parents had left you an important and valuable heirloom, this also goes into your husband's possession. And whether or not he's willing to return this family heirloom to your parents is entirely up to him. So therefore, being married also means saying yes to passing your estate to your spouse in the event of your death. Unless, of course, if you sign a will stating that your intentions are actually otherwise. The point of this talk is not to scare you away from marriages. I am married myself. My objective is to impress upon you what marriage really entails. To note the invisible fine print of every marriage certificate that no one explains to you about. To understand what the terms of exit are, so you can enter into marriage with eyes wide open. Before being swooped off a contract called a marriage that carries implications for a lifetime, treat it as serious as it deserves. Care less about the wedding preparations and care more about coming to an understanding with your partner as to what both of you want in terms of, in the event of an exit of the relationship, if things were to unfortunately go south. If possible, take control and dictate your own terms by considering a prenuptial agreement. And the rest, you leave to destiny. And on this note, I wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you.